Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to part three of this last installment of the Isra and Al Mi'raj. Carry on with a people entering Jannah wa qalu alhamdulillah and they will say alhamdulillah. I.e., they express that where they are now is a bounty by Allah. Of course, they did the actions, but the creation of Jannah is a gift from Allah. And why do they say that? الذي صدقنا وعده who has fulfilled for us his promise i.e. Allah was truthful when he promised and delivered where did Allah promise? in the Quran and then they said so here they say Allah has fulfilled his promise for us and has delivered i.e. he made us until Jannah وأورثنا الأرض and he made us inherit the earth. And they are talking about that earth, not this one here. They're talking about that earth, how they inherited it. <inaudible> to settle in paradise wherever we please. So we will inherit just like you inherit the wealth of your dad and you do in it as you please you inherit his business you inherit whatever on judgment day allah will make us inherit that earth in paradise for us to do in it settle in it do whatever we please in paradise and then allah says what an excellent how excellent is the reward of those who work righteousness. And this is in Surah az zumar 39, Ayah 74. The promise that Allah made to us and will fulfill on judgment day has been mentioned in Al-Quran. وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّابُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ And indeed, we have written in the Zabur, and these are the Psalms given to David. They are part of the Injil, the Gospel. After the dhikr, i.e. after the Torah, إِنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ That the earth of paradise, the, the, the upcoming earth, the paradise there, shall be inherited by my righteous subservience. Again, this is in Surah Al-Anbiya, the Prophets, 21, Ayah 105. My dear sisters and my brothers, our reaction on judgment day, how will that be? Allah has explained in this. He says, لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر The supreme horror of the resurrection day will not disturb us. And so this makes the hadith that the earth, the sun will come to us and will struggle. All that is a lie. Because Allah says in the Quran, the supreme horror, the horror of the resurrection day will not disturb them. It will not reach the believers. وَتَتَلَقَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ And the angels shall receive them and welcome them saying هَذَا يَوْمُكُمُ الَّذِي كُمْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ This is the day or your day which you had been promised, which you were promised. Then Allah tells us when this act shall happen. He says يَوْمَ نَطْوِ السَّمَاءَ كَطَيِّ السِّجِلِّ لِلْكُتُبِ The day we fold up the heavens our heavens, like a writer would scroll the scriptures, i.e. Allah will finish entire creation that exists now and rolls it up like you when you finish reading a book, you close it. Then Allah will close the chapter of this world. And then he says, كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ Just like we began the first creation, we shall produce it once more. The second production will be the earth and heaven. Allah will create exactly what's created now, except the other one will be bigger, as I said, different specification and everything. Why? Because Allah وَعْدًا عَلَيْنَا such is our bound, uh, bonding, uh, binding promise. I, Allah made a promise upon himself and he will honor it to recreate the earth and on that earth, heaven, earth and uh, hellfire, paradise and everything shall be created there. And then Allah says, Inna kunna And we will certainly do that. And this is in Surah Al-Anbiya 21, Ayah 104. So from here you see that Allah promises to recreate this world differently, of course, in another, after the end of this world. So it's impossible that paradise, which is going to be created on a different, on the upcoming earth, exists now. Any hadith that tells you about Rasulullah entering Jannah, saw this in Jannah, are lies. 
Jannah doesn't exist, neither does hell fire. In another ayah, Allah says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا كَيْفَ يُبْدِئُ اللَّهُ الْخَلْقُ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُ Have they not contemplated how Allah starts creation, then would we do it again? Like you plant potatoes, and then you go and you harvest potato, and then you do it again, and Allah does it again. Don't people see that? Of course they do. Then Allah says, Inna dhalika ala Allah yasir. That truly is easy on Allah to create, to create, create, to create. It's simply easy for Allah. And then Allah says, Qul siru fil ard. Do travel the earth. Tell them, do travel the earth. Fanduru kayfa bada al khalq. And see how Allah originated the creation. Meaning, Allah has left clues for us to find out exactly how he began creation from the first atom. Including our own creation, we humans. All that is left for us humans to do is to search the earth and study what we find in it and we will get to how Allah has created this earth and this life on that. Then Allah says, ثُمَّ اللَّهُ يُنْشِئُ النَّشْأَةَ الْآخِرَةَ Then it is Allah who will create the last creation. You see the upcoming earth, the upcoming heavens, the upcoming world, uh, paradise, hellfire. Allah will recreate them, but after the end of this one. And then Allah says, Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. For Allah is most capable of everything. And this is in Surah Al-Ankabut 29 from the Ayah 19 till 20. So it's impossible for paradise to exist. It's impossible. All right. Now for hellfire. The hadith of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj speaks about claim that the messenger had seen some people being punished in hellfire. All right? For example, he saw a group of people, uh, gossipers and backbiters, who were scratching their chest and faces with copper nails. He saw Malik, the guardian of hellfire, with sad and angry face and crying and all that kind of stuff. He saw a man smashing another's has, uh, uh, head, as just uh, mentioned in the previous hadith. He saw people preferring rotten meat to a nice clean because it's not a punishment. They were married, and but they fornicated. All these and any hadith that talks about punishment in hellfire aren't true. What Allah spoke about punishment in hellfire is a promise that he made to the disbelievers and also statement, statements he made to scare people. No one is being punished now. Judgment day hasn't started. You see, what I'm saying now shouldn't be a point of uh, conviction that I'm trying to convince you. It should be a given fact because the Quran, that's what Allah says in the Quran. But because the hadith has taken over, my problem is to make you believe, I swear to you that what Allah says in the Quran is true and the hadith is lying. But it's sad that we got to this point. You see, Allah in the Quran has established a truth and it, that truth is being ignored. When Allah speaks in Surah At-Takwir, and Surah At-Takwir is the Surah number 81, from Ayah 1 till 3, 3. Allah says, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ When the sun is kuwirat, i.e. the sun will be extinguished and will be disposed of, that's it, the light goes away, the heat goes away, everything goes away because the upcoming world will be created in total darkness. There'll be no sun, all right? So the sun will not be needed. So the sun will go away. It will lose its light, it will lose its heat, it will lose its power, light, everything will go away. وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ انْكَدَرَتْ And when the stars shall all be scattered in lose of its light. Of course, the sun goes away, the, the stars will not have any light at all. And then Allah says, وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ And when the mountains will be moved away. They will be caused to travel and gone away. In other words, the earth will lose its force of gravity because the mountains have weight and they are firmly set on earth. But at that time, when everything, when every physics law goes all orient, goes all upside down, then the mountains will travel, the, the, the clouds, everything will break down. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries on.
He says, what is, now he's going to speak about the judgment day. He says, what is the suhufu nushirat? And when the scrolls, i.e. people's books of deeds, shall be spread and unfolded. What is, because you see, remember when you receive our book of deeds with the right or left hand? That's what Allah is talking about now. What is the sama kushitat? And when the sky shall be stripped off and taken away from its place. Think of it, you removing the wallpaper. You scrap it away. That's, you, you, that's what kushitat. And then I wanted to pay attention. What is the jahim su'irat? And when hell is lit, when hell is said to blaze in fire, it's kindled. I.e. hellfire right now is not lit and it doesn't have fire. Hellfire will be lit on judgment day. And then Allah says, وَإِذَا الْجَنَّةُ أُزْلِفَتْ And when paradise, Jannah, after its creation in the upcoming world, is brought near. When, when someone tells you, oh, someone is being punished now in hellfire, it's hot and things like that, it's, it's a lie. Allah says in the Quran that hellfire has not been lit again. It's not because it's not created. Al-Jannah also has not been created because Jannah will be brought near to us. On judgment day, Allah will create Jannah away from where we are going to be held responsible. And when he's going to hold us accountable, They'll be there and Allah will be there in his majesty in a manner that befits his majesty. The angels will be there. We will be there. And then the final places where people will end up, it's either paradise or hellfire, will be brought. Paradise and hellfire will be dragged and brought to us, to the land where we are going to be held responsible. And there... If you do good, you straight away go to Jannah. And if you do evil, straight away go to hellfire. This is why Allah says, Wa al jannatu uzlifat. And when paradise is brought near, at that moment, alimat nafsun ma ahdarat. Each soul shall, on that day, particular moment, know what it has put forward. Because you will have the book of actions right in front of you. And you'll be either carrying it with the right hand or the left hand. The right hand, you know you've done good. Left hand means you have done bad. This is why on that judgment day, both paradise and hellfire shall be created there and then. And then they'll be brought forward so that a human can see them right in front of them. And then Allah says, وَأُزْلِفَتِ الْجَنَّةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And paradise, Jannah, after its creation in the upcoming world, will be brought near to the pious. وَبُرِّزَتِ الْجَحِيمُ لِلْغَاوِينَ And hellfire, again Jahannam, hellfire after its creation will be emerged to the deviants. This is in Ash-Shu'ara, Ash that's Surah number 26, Ayah 90 to 91. In another Ayah, Allah says, وَجِيءَ يَوْمَئِذٍ بِجَهَنَّمَ And on that day, hellfire, after its creation, of course, will get brought near. This is in Surah Al-Fajr 89, Ayah 23. So according to the Quran, in all simplicity, paradise and hellfire do not exist right now. Because they are part of the afterlife. They both are part of a long distant future that hasn't arrived yet. Claiming that Jannah, paradise and hellfire exist now is claiming that the next life also exist now. And this is impossible because they cannot coexist at the same time. You cannot be alive and dead at the same time. You cannot be old and newly born at the same time. You see, for you to be old, you gotta stop being young. And for you to be young, you cannot be old. But the hadith tells us that, okay, you can be old and young at the same time. Hellfire exists now. In this life exists now, it cannot be. But anyhow, there are this and the other one. They're supposed to exist one after the other and not at the same time. In Mecca, Allah issued a threat to the disbelievers in which he mentioned what was waiting them in, on judgment day. He says, حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتِ Until when death comes to one of them. قَالَ رَبِّ 
that person says, my Lord, return me back to life. I don't want to die. Because at the time of death, remember, the angels will come with good or bad news. Why would he want to return that? لَعَلِّي أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا فِي مَا تَرَكْتِ So that I may act righteously in that which I have left behind in my life before my death. Then Allah answers, كَلَّا Certainly and absolutely not. You're not going to return back. Why? Because Allah knows humans, we tend to forget. Allah says, كَلَّا إِنَّهَا كَلِمَةٌ وَقَائِلُهَا Now it's just a request. He is just making. And when I say he is, it also includes women because he is both men and women. And then Allah says, وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ What's awaiting them? Barzakhun and behind them is a barzakh. Barzakh is a barrier. That barrier shall remain. That is, you see, there is a barrier. We'll, we will go and sleep behind that barrier. And we will remain behind that barrier until the day of resurrection. Meaning, when we die, your body goes back to earth. But your soul, your spirit, whatever, goes back to another world. And that world is the in between this life and the upcoming life. In the other world, we will sleep exactly like we sleep at night. Once you die, your soul gets taken, and there is a barrier, a wall that we cannot. Uh, go beyond and come back to this life. That's why spirits and haunting and all this is nonsense. Okay? But anyhow, so once you are there, you sleep and you await judgment day. That's why when we sleep, if someone has died 10,000 years ago or has died now, when we sleep, we lose touch with time. And when we, all we know is when we wake up, hey, guess what? It's judgment day. And this one is in Surah Al-Mu'minun 23 from Ayah 99 to 100. So my dear sisters and my brothers, we have two lives and a passage in between them. We live now, and then when we die, we go to the barzakh life, i.e. to the wall, when we, when we sleep, and then we await judgment day. Anyone who tells you someone is being punished in hellfire now or in the grave and all those things are just pure conjectures built on hadith wrong uh, statements. The Quran disagrees with this all the times. Now that you have uh, got it to the point where we know that Allah, uh, Jannah doesn't exist now and the hellfire doesn't exist now, don't be scared. Do your job. Repent to Allah. And know that when we die, it's just a transportation to the upcoming world which hasn't been uh, created yet. When Allah terminates this world and would create the upcoming one, this one has to go first for the next one to take place. Because there'll be another earth. For the other earth to exist, this earth has to go. For the other heavens to exist, these heavens must go. Such is what the Quran says, such is what contradicts the, the hadith. And I pray to Allah, this is clear by now. I want to mention to you a hadith that I have debated of mentioning or not, but I will say, because the, the hadith of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj are hadith that opens big gates to disbelief, to blasphemy, really, Believing in Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj is believing in blasphemy, truly. Because so many things have been made and Allah has been ridiculed to no end. Please go back to my previous talks about this uh, point here and you will see that Rasulullah gives 50 prayers, Musa objects, Muhammad goes back to... So Musa knows better about us than Allah himself. Please go back to my previous talks. I have explained this far more than anything else. So as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... Um, but anyhow, I will tell you the hadith that I mean here. And it's called al-hadith al-mala uh, al-a'la. Al it's called the highest assembly dispute. This is how it's known. This hadith is not like this. The hadith gives something about this. Abdullah ibn Abbas narrates that the messenger of Allah said. And before I go ahead and read the hadith, this hadith narrative, I'd like to say that this narrative is considered authentic and is widely accepted and taught. So 
Abdullah ibn Abbas, whatever he said, is actually a belief. To the sheikhs today, if you don't believe in this hadith, you cannot be a Muslim. And I, Abdul Salam, say I rejected not 100%, I rejected 1 billion percent. But anyhow, here is the hadith, and you will see why I reject it. And this will give you an idea why the hadith has taken precedence over the Quran and why people, when they want to, oh, if the Quran is by itself is a sole authority, how did we learn how to pray? How did the salat take like that? Why? Because they take what the hadith tells them, and what the hadith tells them, they use it as a tool against the Quran. It's, it's crazy what they're doing. But anyhow, the hadith goes something like this. Last night, my Lord came to me in the best of appearances. This is Muhammad talking. And he's saying to his companions, last night, Allah came to me and I saw him in the best of his appearances. I.e. Allah manifested himself in a shape that the messenger could see. And he knew that that was Allah. If this is not blasphemy, I don't know what is. That's why when people, when people say Jesus is son of God and we call them disbelievers, we have worse than what they have done. One of them is this one here. My Lord came to me in the best of appearances. The best of appearances. It's not, uh, and this hadith is reported by a Tirmidhi. Tirmidhi is a student of Al-Bukhari. Ahmed ibn Hanbal is a teacher of Al-Bukhari. And this hadith is authenticated and considered as sahih by Al-Albani himself. Al-Albani 100% believes in this craziness. But anyhow, so last night, my Lord, my God, Allah came to me in the best of appearances. All right? Now, as I said, if this is not blasphemy, I really don't know what is. But anyhow, he, i.e. one of the narrators said, I think, and there we go, we go into I think, a hadith like this we cannot use, I think. But anyhow, I think he said it was a dream. So we don't need to dream awake, but it doesn't matter. He, i.e. Allah said, Muhammad, do you know about what the highest assembly of angels dispute? I.e. they argue with each other? I.e. Muhammad, you have a knowledge about what the angels high above are debating between themselves? I said, no. To me, Abdul Salam, I would say this is crazy. Allah knows the messenger doesn't know. Why is he asking him if he knows? Okay. Allah could have just told him. But why does he ask him to tell no? But anyhow, so Allah, to, to reveal to Rasulullah, to the messenger, what the high assembly of angels are debating, no, no, ya Allah forgive us for what I'm going to say but this is what's in, out there so so this is the uh, Muhammad speaking messenger of Allah speaking so he i.e. Allah placed his hand between my shoulder blades until I sensed it's i.e. Allah's hand coolness between my chest my breasts so the hadith says that Allah placed his hand behind on the shoulder blades of the messenger and the messenger felt the coolness of Allah's hand on his front chest. But anyhow, another version of the hadith says, or on my throat. So he, either he felt on his chest, on his throat, you know, the hadith, it's okay, it's either this or that, no big deal, but we are supposed to believe in this nonsense. And then what, what comes after is extremely disturbing. And there I knew what was in the heavens and what was in the earth. Strange. Suddenly Allah puts his hand between the shoulder blades. The messenger feels the coolness. Suddenly the messenger becomes knowledgeable of everything that is in the heaven and everything that is on earth. If Allah had injected in his messenger all this knowledge of what's taking place in the heavens and the earth, why does Allah need Jibreel to bring the Quran? Why doesn't Allah do the same thing with the Quran? Why doesn't Allah make the Quran a personal issue between him and Muhammad? Why stick Jibreel in between? Why didn't Allah use this technique with Adam? 
to teach him. Why did Allah teach Adam? Why did he just put his hand between his shoulder blades and Adam would have known everything? Why did Allah teach Adam? Astaghfirullah. Why didn't Allah do it with the angels? One placement of his hand on their back, et voila. Then the angels will learn everything. Why doesn't Allah do this with us? Why doesn't Allah place his hands between my, my shoulder and I become knowledgeable in everything? I want to scream. Allah, I want to scream. Back to Allah's putting his hand on the messenger's shoulder blades. This creepy, this cringy thing. The messenger says, so everything became clear to me and I gained the knowledge. Allah asks again, Muhammad, do you know on what the highest assembly of angels dispute? I said, yes. They are disputing. Now Muhammad is going to speak because now he knows. They are disputing the acts of Tawbah, atonement. And the acts of atonement that Allah forgives with are lingering in the masjid after Salat. This is for the unemployed, for the losers in this life. You perform salat and you stay in the masjid, you do nothing. You die out of hunger, no problem. You don't work, no problem. All what matters is staying in the masjid. And I see them today here in England. They are unemployed. They get the taxes that people pay and the government feeds them. And they just sit in the masjid, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, wearing a long dress, Arabian dress, and they think they are pious. They're going to go to Jannah because they're the best people. They don't contribute to anything good. But anyhow, so lingering in the masjid after the Salat and walking on the feet to the congregations of Salat and performing wudu against their desires. <laughs> this is what the angels are debating. Just all of it about Salat. All of it about Allah Banu Umayyah have succeeded into mutilating our Islam to keep people in the masjid to control them to know where they are. Oh, but anyhow, then the Prophet carried on saying, and whoever does that, i.e. you linger in the masjid, you walk to the prayer with your foot, you don't get on anything, and you perform your wudu against your desires, shall live in goodness and die with goodness. Yeah, we see that. We see how people are today in this countries where they just sit in the masjid and they walk and they do nothing, we see how advanced and how happy they live, these people. And then he says, and his wrongs shall be like that of the day his mother gave him birth, sinless, big lie. So that means on judgment day, Allah has nothing to hold you accountable for. See, Muslims, wallahi, we play with our Ashura, the next year and this year for, uh, forgiven. Arafah, the next year forgiven. You say, subhanAllah, a hundred times, Allah will forgive all your sins. Meaning on judgment day, Allah will have nothing to forgive you and nothing to hold you accountable with. Because that's it, you come to him completely as if you are born. But, but what can we say? That's the price for, prayer, for believing in the hadith. But anyhow, he, Allah, said, Muhammad, when you have performed a salat, do say. Now Allah is going to teach Muhammad to say after salat. Oh Allah, I ask of you the doing of good deeds and the avoiding of evil deeds and the loving of the poor. And if you have willed for your subservient, for people, any fitna, adversity or trouble or affliction, then take me to you free from the fitna. The prophet then said, and the acts that raise ranks are, he's still carrying on the conversation with Allah here. Of course, keep in mind, the Prophet is talking without being asked here. At the beginning, Allah asked him, but now he is volunteering information. He's telling Allah. He doesn't ask, answer questions anymore. He just informs Allah now. He tells Allah, whatever, that uh, the acts that raise ranks are spreading the salam. Assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum. This spreading of salam is because when Muslims, uh, the companions, went into battles and they killed each other, everybody was hating and there was uh, civil wars, they brought this hadith so that people start saying salamu alaikum to bring people down, no more fighting. Just like the salam we say in the salat to the right and to the left, is not to say to the angels, but back then due to the political, uh, political turmoils, they needed this salamu alaikum. So you see people in the street, salamu alaikum, salamu alaikum, salamu alaikum, so people don't kill each other anymore. No more attempts, no more exploding, no more bombs, no more killings. But anyhow, that's the reason why. But anyhow, 
feeding others. And you perform salat during the night while the people are sleeping. As I said, this hadith is by At-Tirmidhi Ahmed and is authenticated and considered sahih by Al-Bukhari. Tirmidhi said, remember I said Tirmidhi is a student of Al-Bukhari and Ahmed is the teacher of Al-Bukhari? Well, At-Tirmidhi said, I asked Al-Bukhari about this hadith. Al-Bukhari said that it is an authentic and good hadith i.e. Mr. Al-Bukhari also agrees on it. This blasphemous hadith narrative, this blasphemous hadith narrative is agreed upon. And it also has other different versions, by the way. In one of them it says, so everything, when, after Allah put his hand, of course, on the shoulder, uh, it's even heavy to say this, put his hand on the shoulder blades, but that's what they say. I don't believe it. But that's what they say. They say after Allah put his hand on the shoulder blade, so everything got uncovered before me and I knew. That's it, Muhammad knows everything. I knew what is in the heavens and what is on earth. I knew what was between the east and the west. There was not a thing that Allah asked me about that I didn't know. It means the Prophet's knowledge became equal to Allah's knowledge. Because whatever Allah asked, Muhammad knew. There was nothing that Allah could have asked that Muhammad didn't know. Anything that Allah asks, Muhammad knew. If this is not blasphemy, if this is not shirk, if this is not disbelief, I don't know what is. But Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Ahmed al-Albani, all these people have no problem with this. And the majority of the sheikhs today have no problem with that either. Curse the inventor of this blasphemous hadith narrative. Allah says in Al-Quran, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا مُنْذِرٌ Tell them, Muhammad, I certainly am only a warner only a warner, subhanAllah. وَمَا مِنْ إِلَهٍ إِلَّا اللَّهِ الْوَاحِدُ الْقَهَارِ And there is no God but Allah, the one, the all dominant. رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفَّارِ The Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them, the Almighty, the forgiver. قُلْ هُوَ نَبَأٌ عَظِيمٌ Say, this Qur'an is a momentous message. أَنْتُمْ عَنْهُ مُعْرِضُونَ From which you are turning away. Pay attention to the next ayah. مَا كَانَ لِيَ مِنْ عِلْمٍ بِالْمَلَئِ الْأَعْلَى إِذْ يَخْتَصِمُونَ I have no knowledge of the highest assembly of the angels as they dispute. The Qur'an says that Muhammad has no idea of the highest assembly of angels when they dispute. The hadith says he does. You see now why the Qur'an is completely ignored? Because the Qur'an doesn't agree with these humanly based, made up narratives. And then Allah ends this ayah by saying, إِيُّحَا إِلَيْهِ it only is revealed to me because I am only a clarifying warner. This is in Surah Sad and the Ayah 65 to 70. So as you can see, my dear sisters and my brothers, the Quran says I have no knowledge of the highest assembly as they dispute. The Hadith says that the messenger has knowledge of the highest assembly of angels as they dispute. Go choose. I will mention another blasphemous hadith of the messenger visiting Allah in his house. Yes, there is a hadith in Al-Bukhari where Allah now dwells in a house and the messenger goes to visit him in his house. So why am I telling you these hadiths of blasphemy and things like that? Because I want you to know that the hadith, if you believe in them, you have to blaspheme, you have to commit shirk, you have to commit disbelief. You cannot believe in the Qur'an and the hadith. Anyone who believes in the Qur'an or the hadith is a liar, it's either one or the other. If you believe in the hadith, you cannot follow the Qur'an and this is what's happening today. 
I'm gonna mention you a hadith that said where the messenger of Allah visits Allah in his house. Allah says in the Quran, some faces on that day, i.e. on judgment day, shall be radiant, glowing, and bright. And this is in Surah Al-Qiyamah 75, Ayah 22. As you can see, the ayah is clear. Does not require any further explaining, right? Comes judgment day, people's appearance shall be according to their deeds. Good people shall have radiant, bright faces and everything. But people who have done bad shall have faces that are dark, black, blue, whatever the colors are. Did the sheikhs leave Allah's clear words as they are? Of course not. They went and launched a world of differences as to what the meaning of this ayah is. To support a particular agenda, they report a hadith narrative reported by Al-Bukhari and few others. This hadith narrative can be found in a long hadith about the Prophet intercession on Judgment Day. Again, I will make a talk about the lie of the intercession and why there is no intercession on, have, on Judgment Day. Of course, the Quran way, okay? But anyhow, this, this is a non-existent intercession that Salafism and Salafis believe in. But anyhow. And I want your attention, please, as I go through the upcoming uh, text. Okay, because be before I read this hadith narrative, and, and also this hadith narrative is taken extremely, extremely seriously with the sheikhs. Allah says in Al-Quran to Muhammad in this life, when the messenger was alive, Allah tell, told him something very, very clear. Once Allah decrees that someone is going to hellfire and goes to hellfire, and nobody is going to take that person out of hellfire. Allah says to Rasulullah, to the messenger, So is it then that when the judgment of torture has been pronounced on somebody, Are you then the one, Muhammad, who is going to save them from inside hellfire? I take them out, you're going to save them from hellfire? In other words, once Allah decrees who is going to go to hellfire, there will not be anyone who can intercede on behalf of someone to get them out of hellfire. Nobody, not even the messenger of Allah. Now let us see what part of the long judgment day intercession hadith and what it says about this. Because it says that Rasulullah will on judgment day go into hellfire and take people out of hellfire. And this is a lie. The messenger will not be, the Quran says this, because it's either we believe in the Quran or in the Hadith. I choose to believe in the Quran. But anyhow, they say that one day on judgment day, people will need someone to intercede for them, for Allah to start the judgment day. They will go to Adam, he will tell them, go to Nuh, go to Ibrahim, go to Moses, go to Jesus. And then they will go to Jesus who will say, I am not fit for this undertaking, i.e. to go to Allah and intercede on your behalf so that Allah starts judgment day. No, I cannot do that. Jesus tells them, you better go to Muhammad. Okay, and then he tells them he is the subservient whose past and future sins have been forgiven by Allah. Let's say Jesus knows the future now. The Quran was revealed 600 years later, but Jesus knows that Allah had forgiven the past and future sins of uh, the messenger, knowing that Jesus didn't have a single sin to begin with. But, but anyhow, then they said, people would go to the messenger and they will tell him, oh Muhammad, please ask your Lord to, to intercede, intercede on our behalf to Allah, ask him please, and then the messenger says, so they will come to me and I will ask my Lord's permission to enter his house. And then I will be permitted to enter it. So Rasulullah goes to Allah in his house. He will seek permission to enter into Allah's house and they will, and he will be granted that permission. And then the messenger enters the house. And then he says, when I see him, when the messenger sees Allah, I will fall down in prostrations before him.
And he, Allah, will leave me in prostrations as long as he wants. And then he will say, Muhammad, lift up your head and speak, for you will be listened to, i.e. you will be granted. Everything that you ask for shall be granted. And intercede, for your intercession will be accepted. And ask for anything, for it will be granted. This contradicts the Quran 1000%. Then I will raise my head and glorify my Lord with certain praises which he has taught me then. Okay? Then Allah will give me a quota to intercede. I, he tells him, go and take people who said, La ilaha illallah. The messenger goes into hellfire, takes people who said, La ilaha illallah, and comes out. But he sees there are more Muslims left there. Then he will go again to Allah's house and does the same thing. Ask for permission to enter the house. He'll be granted the permission to enter the house. He goes inside the house, prostrates. Allah teaches him. And then the second time, Muhammad raised, ask, you'll be given, intercede, you'll be accepted, and ask for anything, shall be granted. Rasulullah, the messenger will say, Ya Allah, my people in paradise, my followers. Then Allah tells him, go and take anyone who has a small amount of la ilaha illallah in their heart. All right? It, usually it's the, the size of a carrot. That's what it is. Okay. And then the messenger goes to hellfire, takes a great number of Muslims. And then on the third time, in another hadith, he goes four times, but the, the Bukhari once says three times. And then he goes to the third time, the same thing. Asking permission to enter Allah's house and, oh, and then prostration. And then Allah will tell him, go to hellfire and take out anyone who has an atom weight of la ilaha illallah in his heart. Take them out of hellfire. Now compare this nonsense to what Allah says in the Quran. So is it that when the judgment of torture has been given on somebody, are you then, Ya Muhammad, the one who is going to save whoever is inside hellfire? But the hadith says, yes, Muhammad is going to do that. And this is a huge, big lie. You see, this, this tale of fiction is incredible. It's, it's, I, I, I really, I, but anyhow, I, I want to I go to another hadith. You, you got the point. There is no such thing as intercession. And you can see how this blasphemous hadith, the sheikh believe in them. And they think they still perform Tawheed of Allah. And then we make fun of the Christians when they say Jesus is Son of God. I prefer Jesus Son of God, which is a lie, as opposed to Rasulullah entering the house and Allah putting the hand and all these things. This upcoming hadith will drive you nuts. Because there is a man that actually rebukes Allah, yells at Allah, is mad with Allah, shouts at Allah. And Allah is okay with that. Yeah, Allah is, 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 Allah is okay with that. The, the title of this blasphemous hadith in Arabic is Musa Yu'atibu Rabbah. Musa reprimands and rebukes his God, his Lord. Yes, you heard right. This is not a fabrication nor an allegation or a weak hadith. This is an authentic hadith. And this hadith is mentioned in many books namely by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Ibn Hajar, uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani was born in Asqalan. Asqalan is a present in Palestine. He was born in the 8th century and died in the 9th Hijri century. 500 years ago from our time, it's about 600 years ago, that's all. And it is this man who has invented for us Al-Bukhari as we know it today. He's the real composer. He's the real author of Al-Bukhari. You see, when Ibn Hajar came to life 600 years ago, there were 13 versions of Al-Bukhari. One, three versions of Al-Bukhari. And they were all contradictory. And it was this man, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, that studied and then he did and he reconciled amongst them and he made a collage and did a lot of things. That's why we have one single Bukhari. Before him, there were 13 versions. When Ibn Hajar commented on Al-Bukhari, al hadith of Al-Isra al-Mi'raj, when he got to the part where the messenger spoke to Musa, 
Okay? And then left on, the, uh, on this to the seventh. You see, when Rasulullah came to Musa on the seventh heaven and was going to meet Allah, this is where Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani uh, talks about this incident here. All right? He said, Musa wept very hard. And this is in Al-Bukhari, Muslim, and all the books of Hadith uh, that mention the Isra and the Mi'raj. And when Musa wept very hard, he made a remark, he made a comment. Someone asked him, why are you crying, Musa? Musa answered, I weep because a young kid has been sent, the young kid is Muhammad, has been sent after me whose followers will enter paradise in greater number than my followers. So Musa is jealous that Muhammad's followers will be much bigger than his. So he's crying as to how come Muhammad's followers are more bigger than the number is bigger than mine. So, and then again, how did Musa know of how many people Muhammad followers are going to enter paradise? Isn't he supposed to be behind the barzakh, as I said, the wall of death where he is asleep, has no clue of what's going on? And judgment day hasn't started for Musa to know how many of his and how many of Muhammad's will enter paradise, right? But anyhow, Ibn Hajar added, in another version by Anas ibn Malik, where Anas ibn Malik is the, the 10, years kid, 10 years old kid whose mother brought him to serve the messenger. That's him. And then he said, I never thought, Musa, I never thought somebody would be elevated higher than me. So Musa always thought he completely forgot about Jesus and things like that. But now, in another version of Abu Sa'id al Khudri, he says, the children of Israel claim that I was, Musa speaking, okay? The children of Israel claim that I was the most honored with Allah. But this one, Muhammad, is higher than me. That he didn't accept. Al-Umawi, this man is, is a scholar called Al-Umawi, added, if this privilege was for him alone. So Musa saying, if this privilege was for Muhammad alone, that would have been easy on me. But that, that privilege is also for his followers. So Musa is having hard times with the number of people entering paradise, as if it was his business. Just to this point, yeah, Musa? Of course, all this is nonsense. It's a total absurdity. The messenger of Allah don't have this low life uh, esteem. They don't have these stupid issues. But this is what the hadith, believing in the hadith. So when someone comes to me and says, oh, how did you learn how to pray then in the number of rak'at? You must accept this hadith. Then I must bring this kufr hadith and read them to them and say, do you believe in this? If they say yes, they disbelieve. And if they say no, and I said, okay, if you don't believe in this, why are you believing in the other one? And then we become playing table tennis games. All right? You see, Musa is a man that Allah had created and manufactured for himself. As Allah told us in the Quran, talking to Musa, he said, and that you are fashioned, made up, manufactured under my supervision. Taha 20, ayah 39. Couple ayat later, Allah revealed another extremely interesting fact about Musa. Allah says that was to Kalinafsi, and I modeled you, Musa. I manufactured you, Musa. I produced you for myself. Musa was special, was custom made human by Allah for Allah. When you compare Musa to Muhammad, there is no way that Muhammad could be better than Musa. It's impossible. You can't compare them, both of them. Musa's mother had received revelation from Allah about Musa, while Muhammad's mother didn't even believe in Allah, as Musa's mother did. Then how is it then that Musa became jealous? Has Allah failed to teach Musa not to be jealous in this matter? This matter is not under Musa's control. Musa has got special status with Allah. If anything, Musa was directly spoken to by Allah. Something no other, absolutely no other has experienced either on earth or in heaven. Nobody. 
This and any other hadith that place Muhammad better than Musa are very disturbing and so un-Islamic, especially that Allah has ordered us in the Quran not to differentiate between his messengers. They all are equal, they all are human, sent by Allah with one message. Allah can differentiate between them, but we cannot. That's why Allah mentioned certain things through which he favors one prophet over the other. But to us, they all are the same to us. Let's go on. In another version by Abu Ubaidah, son of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, from his father, i.e. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud speaks now about the issue of Musa with Allah. So the messenger of Allah, they said, passed by Musa. And the messenger Muhammad overheard Musa raising his voice on Allah, i.e. yelling at Allah. What was Musa saying? He was saying the following. You honored and privileged him over me? As if it were a quarrel at home. You see when you hear your mother yelling at your brother, you tell your friend, oh, this is just my mother, you know, giving a hard time to my brother. You telling your friend, don't worry about it, it's just nothing, right? Well, the same thing happened here. Jibreel said to Muhammad, this is Musa. And then he said, and Prophet Muhammad asked him, and who is he reprimanding? Jibreel answered, he is reprimanding his God, Allah, because of you. So Musa reprimanding, rebuking, yelling, shouting, is mad, angry with Allah because of whom? Of Muhammad. If this is not the time to pull your hair, I don't know when that is going to be. Prophet Muhammad said, and he, i.e. Musa, raises his voice over his God? Jibreel answered, yeah, 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 yeah. Allah is aware of his bad temper. <laughs> Allah is aware of his bad temper. Okay, so much for Allah fashioning, modeling, producing Musa for himself. Because of that, Allah has done a lousy job. His, the, Allah's personal supervision to how Musa should grow has failed miserably. If Musa can yell at Allah, scream at Allah, reprimand Allah, rebuke Allah, gets mad at Allah, shouts at Allah, if that is the education of Allah, why is Allah making a big fuss when kids shout at their parents? No, it shouldn't be a big deal if, if a human being is shouting at his God. Here is another version of this blasphemous, authentic hadith. Al-Bazzar and Abu Ya'la and few other scholars proved and respected in the Salafi sphere, okay, and they call them righteous predecessors, said that Prophet Muhammad said, I heard a loud protest and a grumble. The grumble is when you complain with a bad tem uh, temper and you are discontented mood, you're absolutely uh, fuming. So I asked Jibril about this, and Jibril answered, This is Musa. And I said, And who is he yelling at? Jibril said, He is, uh, he answered, At his God, at his Lord. Muhammad said, His Lord? Jibril said, His Lord knows about Musa's bad temper. As I said, this hadith has been authenticated by Ibn Hajar, and the scholars are mentioned, and also by Al-Albani. When the scholars debated this, what Ibn Hajar has mentioned and the other books of Hadith, it was a big problem for them. They said the reason Musa cried was because he realized the huge reward he missed and not because he was envious because envy is not permitted in the upper world, in the heaven, things like that. What they were trying to do is justify that Musa, when he was crying, they didn't care that about Musa yelling at Allah. They didn't care about Musa shouting, reprimanding, rebuking, and having a go. No, that is no problem. But what, cared, what they cared about is Musa crying. And how he had missed opportunity to make rewards. And that hurt him. I say to this lie. And I say it about this stupidity and all this nonsense. Okay, because they wanted to escape the jealousy plot and committed worse than that. How did Musa realize that he had missed huge rewards? 
Who told him that? Judgment day hasn't been yet. If Musa was having a go at Allah, if Musa was yelling at Allah, if Musa was rebuking Allah, that means only one thing. He wasn't at all happy with what was going on and Allah did let him down. Because it, at the end of the day, everything that Musa did and Allah had ensured that Musa was created, tailored to Allah's needs on how to deal with Pharaoh and the children of Israel. Allah says in the Quran, لا يسألوا عما يفعلوا وهم يسألون. Allah cannot be questioned for what he does, but they will be questioned. This is in Surah Al-Anbiya 21, Ayah 23. So and what is Musa doing? He's angry at Allah. About whom? About Muhammad. Uh, the scary thing is Musa, <laughs> why do you weep Musa? And, and, and it bothers them more than him shouting at Allah. But anyhow, as I said, Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, the, the, the hadith of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj are gateways to kufr and disbelief. Yet, each year they are celebrated by 99.99% of millions of people, including the sheikh. Including the sheikh. For your information, and I will end the, the, this talk with this here, Allah has never, ever been seen by anyone. Not the angels, not Jibreel, not Adam, and not Shaitan. You know in the conversation when Allah talks to Shaitan, why did you do that? It was all done through revelation. Allah has never, ever been seen. Allah says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ يَحْمِلُونَ العرش, Those angels that carry their responsibilities to Allah's creation, that do, that work, they do everything, the wind, the rain, everything. وَمَنْ حَوْلَهُ And those angels surrounding the Allah's creation, the earth, the heavens and everything. All of these, يُسَبِّحُونَ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ They glorify the praises of their Lord. وَيُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ The angels believe in Allah. وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And they seek forgiveness to the believers. The angels believe in Allah. This, and to believe, you cannot, if, you see, if you're looking at something, you don't need a belief, you can see it. The only time you believe in something is when you don't see it and you believe in its existence. The angels, they believe in Allah. If the angels could see Allah, There was no need for Allah to say that the angels were believing in Allah. We have few questions about this Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj story before I pass on to the next topic. Probably I should stop here, inshallah, and go to part or to part number four of this talk. And again, this is your brother Abdul Salam, and this is part of my Isra and Al-Mi'raj about the Salat, where it comes from, answering the question, If the Quran is by itself is uh, the sole authority, how did you learn about how to pray? All this series talks about this particular talk and off to part number four. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.